Hello and welcome to the Race Dilemma podcast. My name is Drew Hawley and I'm here with my brother and co-host Daniel Sloan. This podcast is really about giving a voice to those people of a mixed heritage. Initially within our own family whose racial background is not always obvious due to their pale skin colour and have found themselves to be at the centre of a personal race dilemma and at times having to prove their ethnic credentials in order to be heard. And of course we have broadened the conversation out into the many corners of some of the so-called problems of being from a racially mixed background. And if you feel you may want to contribute or have a story to tell and would like to be featured on an episode, please reach out to us on the Race Dilemma Podcast at gmail.com. And if you really like these episodes, please rate us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and feel free to share with your family and friends. Hello and welcome to episode number seven of the Race Dilemma podcast. In this episode, we interview a dear friend of mine, Dr. Nali Shabo Elliott. She describes herself as being mixed raced and regards herself as an African Australian. She was born in Zambia and lived there until her Australian father decided to move the family to Australia when she was 13. She arrived in the Northern Territory outback in a town called Catherine, known as the place where the outback meets the tropics, with her identical twin sister, brother and father. She is educated to doctorate level and has been a registered nurse for over 20 years. Nali Shabo also won Miss World Australia in 1999 and was the first woman of colour to have won this title. She now lives in Kent with her husband Christian and five children and really I consider them my family. Shabo, thanks so much for joining us on this podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much and thank you for the privilege to be part of your podcast. Oh, you're most welcome. So so Shabo, I wanted to um I wanted to go back a little bit to to when you um was growing up in in Zambia. And because yes. uh, you left Zambia at the age of 13, right? And you arrived in Australia on your 13th birthday. And yes. I wanted to know what, like, what, what was it like being, being mixed raced in Zambia? Like, what, did you have any kind of dilemmas or any uh, kind mm. of awareness of your, your mixed heritage? Like, what, what, what was that like for you? So, firstly, my dad's white, my mom's black. So, definitely fall into that mixed race category in Zambia. But Mm. in Zambia, we have coloreds. It's a term used to describe um, mixed race people. But it tends to be about a mixed race or a brown with a brown creates this colored. You know, Mm. it's, it's... it's unfortunate that that term colored is still used, That's but right. it, it, it really, it really still is, you know, in Southern Africa. And therefore we fitted into that colored um, group, but we weren't fully accepted as the coloreds because my mom was black, my dad was white. So growing up, we played with a lot of black kids because we lived in um, on a farm. So we played with the locals, but we went to this international school where There was all different races and we just fitted in nicely. There was never an issue about the color of your skin ever, you know. But um, when we are with the coloreds, like the pure hardcore coloreds, Mm. they are racist towards black people. And, you know, they call white people honkies and black people. They have names for black people. So I, I did experience the racism they have towards black people in Zambia there, Mm -hmm. but never towards me, you know, because I was accepted, if you like. But then when moving to Australia, that's when I realised, actually, I'm very different. Just go back to that bit that you said about the coloureds. If the coloureds were not accepting of you, they were not accepting of whites, they were not accepting, where did they think they fitted in then? Where where, where was their little niche? Yeah. So they accepted me as um, as mixed race, but you always knew that you weren't fully accepted because you didn't speak the way they did. They have a certain vernacular kind of, the way they talk is very um, uh, different. And so they, they see themselves as their own group, you know. Mm. They, they, in a hierarchy, for instance, the black people at the bottom, and then it, 
come, say, the Indians, the coloreds, the whites, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. So that's where they see themselves. Even up to today, they still have that mindset. Some people mm. in Southern Africa still have that mindset of think, knowing where they are placed. So they'll never marry a black person necessarily because a black person is below them. So they, oh, there's a lot of hierarchy business going on over there, isn't there? Yeah. Of, so there yes, must be. Even up to today. You say that about the term coloreds, but then therefore there must be different categories of coloreds, then mustn't there? If, if there's a brown person, uh, there, there must be. Yes. If they're only, yes. If they're, un, if they're only defined by their skin tone, there must yes. be lots of vari- variations in between. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine too, you know, if you're darker, if you're lighter, if you're this and so forth, probably, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's a really good, um, you know, analysis. But it's funny, over here, like, people use the term coloured, meant you were black, you know. Um, okay. In back, in, back in the day. Back, back in, in the, the day, day exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so a completely different meaning over here. That's interesting. Yeah. People used to say coloured because they thought it was offensive to say black. Exactly. They thought they were less. Right. They thought they were lessening the blow if they said coloured. <laughs> if you called someone black, if you called someone black, that was, oh, you know, you called him black or whatever. But if you said coloured, yeah. that sort of softened it a bit, you know. And mm. communi- yes. communication was made easier. But in fact, it was accepted. There wasn't a problem. I, I say that. I say that. There didn't seem to be. There, there may have been until I heard someone shout out, "I'm oh, not coloured," you know, whatever, you know. But I know yes. that it was a word that was used quite a lot. Yes, can you imagine? The, you know, but we're talking the yeah. other side of the world, aren't we? Yes, because that word coloured is very colonial in its term, you know. It yeah. dates yeah. way back to, mm. it's not a nice word, a, a term, I don't think, to describe us, you know, who are mixed race. So you didn't have any problems at the international school in Zambia, but you had problems when you went to Australia, right? Initially, yes. initially. Yes, initially, initially, yes. So after Lusaka, Zambia, um, after growing up there, ended mm. up in Catherine, the Northern Territory, which is three hours from Darwin, um, on my 13th birthday with, with my identical twin sister and family. Was there anything that, when you, when, you, when you landed there or when you arrived there with your twin sister and your brother, right? And your dad and his family. Yes, well, right? my brother was in another boarding school, but with my dad at the mm-hmm. time, yeah. Mm-hmm. Was there any, I mean, the landscape, the people, <laughs> they would have been just totally and utterly different to Zambia. Right? I mean, it's the other side of the earth, isn't it? Yeah, completely. Was it easy to adapt? Did you find it easy to adapt? No, it took time. It took a, yeah. quite a lot of time, yes. And reason being is because um, the mindset of the people mm-hmm. in this town very different to what we're used to. So pretty much when we arrived, the white people, if, you, if I can put it that way, the white students in our school didn't quite know where to place us because they had Aboriginal mixed race people, um, if you like, and then they had us and they thought well, where do these people, where do these girls fit, you know? So we ended up getting a lot of, um, of, I think it was mainly ignorance really because they knew we'd come from Africa, but they still thought we have monkeys swinging on the trees in our backyard, we live in huts. So we are always um, confronted with these ignorant comments about where we'd come from and whether and whether, you know, we should go back to where we've come from, which is <laughs> is living in the huts, mud huts. I mean, it, that, that's, I mean, I mean, that's relatively recent, isn't it? So you can imagine that all the images they had of Africa was of that, wasn't it? Mud huts and monkeys yes. and wherever else. Not, yes. not of the city that uh, Lusaka, no. is it? Not, not yes, of Lusaka. The, not, not a picture of Lusaka with its buildings and its people and its cars and its market. They're none of that. No. They, they just... Yeah, they thought you came from some village in wherever, whatever. Yes, and I think the media is to blame too because um, the images they put up of UNICEF or World Health Organization, it's always about this African child that's in poverty, crying, yeah. you yeah. know, hungry for food. Of course. And these are the kind of images that they have, you know. Mm. But um, I think it was also intrigue. The people were intrigued by us and... Therefore, they didn't, as I said, know where to place us. But eventually, those same people 
became our best friends, if you like. Right. Once they got over that ignorance and got to know us for who we were, and not once just they saw past, our skin colour. Yeah, saw past all that, and they could like once they saw past that. Yes, and, uh, we had a lot of fun. Oh, good. That well, sounds all right. But I mean, you, but the narrow mindedness of the people being up there in Catherine. Yeah. Uh, yes, as you I said, mean, so different from Zambia, and there was a there's a lot of adapting yeah. you had to do. You and your twin sister lot. and your brother. Yes, I mean I don't know if I can use the term rednecks, but it's mm-hmm. it's it was a town full of rednecks, really. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. and yeah. the racial prejudice towards the Aboriginal people is just really rife. You know, they they're so mistreated and so treated like second class citizens in their own country. You know, just. Very, very sad. I did a lot of work experience as well because of my background in health, mm. just working in Aboriginal communities and just getting to see how, you know, if you belong to a different race, you, you get mistreated, I think. Well, why is that, do you think? It sounds like an ignorant thing to say on my part, but what is that because of the history books they or something they were, the, the, the people were fed about the history of Australia and they just automatically, there was a hierarchy there that they had, you know. Yeah. Very good question. So I think it's because white people or the um, first settlers thought they were more superior towards um, the um, First Nation people, if I can call them that, the Aboriginal people. And they thought they were barbaric. They thought they weren't, if I can even be as blunt to say, maybe they didn't regard them as you know, equal human beings. They, they treated them like... Subhuman, yes. subhuman, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, yeah. and that is shown in the actions they took to try and slaughter the whole race or assimilate by wiping out the white race from Aboriginal families, meaning, you know, an Aboriginal woman would um, sleep with a white man, therefore eventually weeding out the blackness <laughs> Oh, I see. It's called the stolen yeah. generation. That oh. was a big, big, big um, issue, which is still going on um, today in terms of the ramifications of that that way of thinking. This also seems like a silly question, but if that were the case, and um, uh, white men were sleeping with Aboriginal women, what um, if the Aboriginal women knew that that was? I don't know. How did, how did they sleep? Why did they sleep with them? I mean, what is there something illegal? Is something illegal going on there? What was what was yeah, that about? I know, but you know, this. I, I guess because the missionaries took these mixed race kids from these couples that had children, and therefore kept them in the um, the mission, and um, and therefore slowly got them to be with white men. To I think it was just maybe an arrangement or I don't know how they managed to get the Aboriginals Mm. to sleep with the white men, but because the white man is so superior, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it it wouldn't take much for him to sort of say, look, come over here and I'll sleep with you. I'll buy you a bottle of beer or, you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Something as simple as that, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned your brother having an experience on on a bus when he was going to school. Yes. Yeah, so he has a very vivid memory about when he first encountered racism. And that was, he went to a private um, boys' college in in Southern Australia, in South Australia. So not in North, North Australia, where we were. And um, a boy on the bus called him, you black baboon. And he mm-hmm. turned around and... That was the first time, poor guy, he was only 12, 13, Mm. he ever experienced racism like that. Now we, my twin sister and I experienced racism with this one girl called Penny. I still remember her. She used to call us all these names like um, you black um, tit, you, you know, monkey this. And it was just horrible. But like, like I said to you before, after a year, two years, we became friends and, you know, we forgave her. But to the point where we used to come home and tell my dad, send us back to Zambia immediately. We are not <laughs> staying here. <Right. laughs> People right. here are very racist and they don't accept us. And we, we want to go back home. 
And as I said to you before, we left our mother in Zambia. Yeah. So we had all of that, um, you know, separation. How can I say? Um, emotional tear from our mother and then experiencing yeah. this kind of rejection, if you like, because of the color of our skin, you know, that was enough to just send you exactly <laughs> packing. Mm. But we, we hung in there, you know, we hung in and um, eventually it was okay. It, it made us tougher. I just want to say on behalf of all of us sitting here now and whoever may be listening, regardless, I just want to sort of right. inf- reinforce that those, those first hurtful experiences, they never really go away, you know, and unfortunately yeah. sometimes it can continue and they stay, it stays with us. Of course it would, you know, if we're children, especially like your brother, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Yes. And, it, and I, I don't know about you, or I just know that, you know, it left me with, an unconscious or conscious sense of not belonging. You know, I, I couldn't quite, I didn't quite yeah. know where to place myself in and um, yeah. can't always, I can't, I couldn't always pinpoint the feeling that I was feeling as a, as a boy when, when people said things, even as an yes. adult when people say things, you know. So those things don't go away. They, they remain, they, they, re, no. they become part of us, don't they? You know? Yeah, it's very true. I mean, in particular in Australia, my brother always feels, and my twin sister as well, racial tension related to the color of their skin. And um, it's really quite sad. And as you say, those feelings from when you were a young child, you know, Mm. being prejudiced, um, someone being prejudiced towards you, it it does carry on in some way where you can enter a setting and have that feeling come up where you feel... Mm. Oh, this whole setting's all white, you know. Um, am I, what are people thinking of me? Am I accepted in this forum or that or so forth? Mm. So one has to really rise above. Because you never know when it's going to rear its head again, do you? You never know, quite know when people might just make some off the cuff comment that's, yeah. that doesn't, that's, that's not seemingly not offensive, done in jest, done it with, yes. you know, with humor, with humor, sometimes with affection, but sometimes yes. these things these things can cut like an eye if you didn't realise that actually no. they're not seeing they're not seeing me as Shabo or Daniel or Andrew. They're seeing me as this yes. person. They're, they're judging me by my colour and not what I'm here to do yes. for them or what you know. Exactly, mm. and I also feel I get judged by my ethnicity. So the fact that I'm African Australian, mm-hmm. so that African, you know, I feel. Um, I don't always feel accepted, you know, because I'm part African and then being Australian, but are you really Australian? You know, you you don't have blonde hair, you don't have blue eyes, you don't have a beach, you know, type body. So Shabu, tell us about Miss World Australia 1999. What was that like for you at the time, being the first woman of colour to have won this title? And I was 20 at the time. And I won it in Darwin. So we went through a lot of heats. So a lot of heats. So heats are a lot of women, you know, yeah. how can I say? You know what I mean anyway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Until there was about 10, 10 of us left. And there was one Asian girl, I remember, and myself. And then the rest were white Australians. Mm-hmm. And so I won. And <laughs> it was just unheard of because, <laughs> you know, I was the first woman of color ever yeah. to have won the crown and yeah. the, how can I say, the negativity that I received. Really? Even as I really? walked off. Yeah, even as I, I mean, not not everyone, but you always remember the three or four and they were yeah. actually part of the, part of the 10 girls. Mm-hmm. Look at her. She's not even Australian. Was this from the, the other girls? From, yeah, from, from the, the other, other girls, girls. Right? From the other girls and their oh. families, because their girls hadn't, they didn't win. So right. I, I right. got a lot of slack. Oh dear. Yeah, and to the point Ooh. where actually I left Australia because I couldn't plow through. You know, I couldn't get through the media, for instance, to or entertainment world to sort of advance myself as Miss World Australia. Everything mm-hmm. was too difficult you know, because of the color of my skin. So I literally left to come to England. And that's why one of the biggest reasons why I left. So that's quite sad, isn't it? So just just to go back to that bit again, 
shape of what yes. you, you left Australia because you couldn't get on in the way that you wanted to because of the color of your skin is that what is that what I heard yes. you say yes and yet you won that title uh, representing yeah. Australia for Miss World yes uh, that, that's conflicting actually that that doesn't quite yeah. make sense how do you go from being a 13 year old in the outback northern territory to meaning to represent in Australia as Miss World yeah, from 13, 13 to 21, that's not even 10 years. And yet you as a wow. person, well, I don't know how you did it, what you did, what you have to go through, but I imagine, imagine it's quite hard. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was. You know. I was going to ask you, actually, um, what with all of these situations and issues that were happening around the time, um, I guess from you know your, your, your time in Australia, um, yeah. What what sort of coping mechanisms did did you did you have in place to kind of to to, to deal with all of this stuff that's yes. just thrown at you? Yeah. So, firstly, having an identical twin sister was a real strength because we bounced mm. off each other, but we also have a faith. So mm. we believe in um, in Jesus and mm-hmm. we went to youth group um, once a week. We went to a local church. And so our youth group consisted of a German girl and um, some Australian guys. And we just became great friends. Um, we also are very athletic. We played a lot of sport. And I think we just occupied our minds and occupied yeah ourselves with positivity that all that negativity that we experienced kind of just um, became, you know, nothing. It was Mm, eliminated by all that we were doing for ourselves. And so my mom is a Christian and she helped us walk this path, you know, and live this life, if you like, of Christianity. And that really helped us all throughout our time in Catherine. Otherwise, I don't think we would have survived, you know, like we did. Mm. It was the strength of the Lord, the joy of the Lord that kept us moving through um, our, our journeys and our lives. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. How did your mum in Zambia, right? You're talking about your mother when you say yes. that. Yes. How did you communicate with mum? Did you Skype? Or? Oh, it was terrible. So we had no Skype um, at that time. Mm-hmm. We wrote we wrote letters. Probably received a letter once a once a year. Once a year. We, yeah, we called each other because um, at the time you could there's telephones, so we spoke on the phone. But it was so hard, and I remember we went back to see her after three years because my father was paying for the fees, so right. we we didn't go yearly. And when we went back, oh my gosh, we just. We cried so much. Oh. We cried at the airport. We cried when we got home. And then it was oh. time to leave because we, we went for a month. It was time to leave. Oh, we cried and we cried. Oh. So we, went, we, we saw our mom once every three years, basically. Yeah. But um, it was very, very hard for us. Oh, and for her as well. And for her, for as, her well. as well. Yeah, because she let us go to experience a better way of life in Australia. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, I think my dad looks back and he probably regrets that we he moved us away from our mum too early, too soon. I mean, that, I mean, that was pretty brave of your mum if that was her primary very intent. Brave. Yeah, I, that I was don't, her I, intent. I mean, she must have really thought about and worried about your future as two young women yes. and a young son. Yes. She wanted yes. the absolute best for you and that's why she yes. did that. And she believed that's exactly that she was doing right. The, yeah, she was doing the right thing. For, and she did do the right thing for you because, look, you've turned yeah. out. You've got a lovely yeah, family of your did. own. Your twin yes. sister and your brother, no doubt, is doing well. So, you know, it paid off yes. that long-term goal, you know. It really paid off, Daniel. I can't tell you. Oh. And I'm very grateful for that decision because had we not and remained in Zambia, I think, as you say, our lives would have been a lot different. And much respect and love to your mum. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. You know, she fantastic. died in a car accident Ooh, at, when did I was she? 24. Yeah, she died in a car accident when I was 24. Oh, was dear. Living here in London. So never really got, she's never got to share in these beautiful you know, gifts that we now have, children, 
you know, husbands. Uh, she's with you, yeah. right? She's with you all the time, right? She's yeah. right here, right here, all I the know. time. Right? Just like you, know? you guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, everything that she wanted for you has come to fruition, yes. hasn't it? You it know? really has. It really yeah. has. So, you know, I want to say that this is my lived experience, you know, yeah. some somebody else will have a different experience of course, of Australia. Of course, of course. And Australia is a wonderful place to live in, you know, and I've got no sort of, um, how can I say, angst about Australia. I'd always, I'd still go back, you know. No bad visit. feeling, no bad feelings. Yeah, no, no bad feelings, yeah. I mean, it, you know, when I won Miss World Australia, I was very disappointed, very disheartened, you know, but I, I came to the UK and I found my place or my fit here. Mm-hmm. I went on to do a doctorate in health research. I work at a very prestigious hospital um, as a registered nurse, and then now I'm head of patient experience. So I haven't experienced racism, you know, in my work environment, even amongst these very prestigious people that I, I meet. And, um, you know, I, so I'm fortunate to have found you know, London. You, your like, place, yeah. Yeah, mo- yeah. yeah you, you feel okay with, uh, yeah, in London, don't yes. you? You feel comfortable yes. walking down the road and no one's going to trouble you, no one's going to say anything, no one's going to give no. you a backward glance. No. That's right. That's so nice to hear. So yeah. nice to hear. Oh, I think we feel, I think we feel the same. We've had experiences, of course, and you do growing up, you know, through, through a certain period in time and, you know, you yes. come out the other. You come out the other end, and if anyone says anything, you're equipped to deal with it because you're experienced. <laughs> because you've got a few brain cells, a few more brain cells, maybe. You know, or you may yes. not be. A, you know, I, I just want to ask Shaba, how, 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 how have you felt this evening, Shaba, talking about it? You know, and I feel there's more we can talk about, to be honest. But you know, yeah, I think uh, there is because I could go into my kids as well. You know, because one says he's brown, the other one says he's white. The brown boy says you're white. I mean, it's just yeah, we can go go on and on. I really enjoyed being with you both, and I feel that um, you make me feel very relaxed and comfortable. It is a sensitive um, topic, but um, I felt very, uh, how can I say, happy to be part of this and to be with you both in this forum because even the questions you ask, like there's nothing that's, you just make it all lovely and nice. Oh, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the Race Dilemma podcast. Yeah, you two are awesome and it's nice to meet you, Daniel, as well. Thank you. And you two, likewise. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. If you've liked what you've heard, please subscribe on your favourite directory. And if you've liked it even more, then please rate us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Again, if you would like to be featured on the Race Dilemma podcast, please reach out to us on the Race Dilemma podcast at gmail.com. That's it from us, and we'll see you on the next episode.